is your last lecture. Is that right? That's correct. Thank you. No, no, I'm good. Should we get started? Yeah, all right. Let's get going for our first talk of the afternoon. This is our last talk from Masha Baryaktar from Washington, telling us more about dark matter. Great. Um, so in the last time, it goes by very fast. So I'll see what I can cover today. But uh, I want to thank everyone for the nice discussions we've been having and also encourage you to reach out if you have questions about particle physics or cosmology, and uh, happy to chat more over coffee break, barbecue, etc. I'm leaving tomorrow morning, so it was nice to meet um, all of you. Um, good. So I want to follow up on a question from last time. So last time we covered uh, two topics. One was evidence or constraints, astrophysical constraints on dark matter, and also axi uh, the QCD axion. So going back for a second to the astrophysical constraints, uh, physical constraints. Um, I want to emphasize some of our knowledge about uh, the Milky Way uh, because that's actually important um, for direct searches, also indirect searches of dark matter. So if we're trying to detect dark matter in the lab, we should know how much of it there is here. Otherwise, our constraints are kind of meaningless. So uh, previously, I mentioned that there are measurements of the total dark matter mass in the Milky Way. Um, so if you're interested in looking up more, there's a recent paper uh, by uh, Watkins, Merrill, et al. Um, this is not my area, so it's not necessarily, it, it's a very nice paper, um, but I might be missing more complete or more recent references. This is just a nice one to look at. Um, <clears throat> and so what they do is they combine measurements of globular clusters <clears throat> which are like dense, clust dense clumps of old stars which are good because they contain they're like self-bound clumps of lots of stars, so they're brighter than just a single star. They're easier to see. Um, so they have from Gaia, which is a telescope that's currently operating and measures velocities of stars all over our, our Milky Way super precisely. Um, so they have 34 of these globular clusters out to uh, 20 kiloparsec. And Hubble Space Telescope which I hope you all have heard of by now. Uh, it measures 12 more. Uh, it can see fainter objects, uh, but a bit less precisely. So it can see out to 40 kiloparsecs. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, our galaxy is a spiral galaxy with extent approximately 30 kiloparsec in the stellar distribution. Uh, this is the center. We live about 8 kiloparsec away from the center. And the dark matter halo extends further out um, by another factor of a few, depending on how you define the end of the halo I means continuous function. Um, and so what they found was that uh, the mass inside 40 kiloparsec is 0.42 plus 0.07 minus 0.06 times 10 to the 12. Of course, the exact number is not super important, but I just want to give you a sense of the error bars. Um, so where you can actually measure these objects, the error bars are quite small, uh, at the order of 10% uh, or so. 
Uh, and then they use models of dark matter profiles to extrapolate to the total virial mass um, to get 1.54 plus 0.75 minus 0.44 times 10 to the 12. <clears throat> so the extrapolation is about a factor of 3 in mass, which leads to bigger error bars depending on your modeling. Um, there's also, if you're really interested in this, there's a review that's called the mass of the Milky Way. And of course, the total mass um, is not the only quantity we're interested in. We're interested in the local density here at 8 kiloparsec, as well as the velocity distribution that enters into some experimental observables. So this review is weighing it all from 2020. Um, and so, and they list a bunch of other methods of measuring the properties of the Milky Way, including tracing out the escape velocity of stars. Of course, if we have, you know, mass in the Milky Way, we don't expect very moving stars. Uh, we expect very fast moving stars to be exponentially unlikely at some point because they would escape the gravitational pull of, of the whole halo. Uh, there are also observations of dwarf galaxies that are orbiting our galaxy. There are numerical simulations, which are really beautiful and have uh, gained a lot of, um, ha have grown in precision incredibly over the last decade, where you literally like, go and find a pair of galaxies that look like our Milky Way and Andromeda galaxy and study their properties and match them onto this. So there's a lot of ways to um, infer these masses, and approximately they all give roughly between 0.5 and 2 times 10 to the 12, and uh, more recent measurements, which are more precise, are kind of zeroing in on this intermediate value. Uh, in addition to that, we also can measure the local dark matter density. So there are some direct measurements of this, uh, which are less precise. Um, by which I mean like within a kiloparsec of us. Uh, and then there's also fitting to the overall model. And this is approximately 0.3 to 0.4 GeV per centimeter cubed. And then we also have the dark matter velocity. Um, this is a Maxwellian distribution in the central, um, the, the average value is about 250 kilometers per second, which is about 10 to the minus 3 of the speed of light. Uh, these quantities are a bit less well known, and there's a lot of debate, but to within, well, this one is pretty well known. Um, this one uh, depends on some details, but within an order of magnitude, it's, it's quite robust, uh, with the exception that, of course, um, there's, there can be, um, so these are important for important for experiment. Uh, and the exception on this number, um, there can be two cases. One is um, the interesting dynamics on large scales um, that are just being understood in the last um, few years, which is that our Milky Way is a result of uh, many mergers as one would expect from structure formation. And so this can lead to some more complicated structure that's not in the kind of dynamical equilibrium that you usually assume. Uh, usually that doesn't change these conclusions very much, but can be important out on the tails of distributions. Uh, also, of course, uh, the other caveat is the uh, microscopic nature of dark matter. So we understand on these scales of orders kiloparsec what the dark matter is doing, but if the dark matter is made up of clumps that are of order of the Earth mass, uh, that's probably excluded, but of order of, say, few solar masses or even um, kind of dense uh, fluctuations, which can come from some axion models. Um, in the vicinity of the Earth, it could be that 
we're in a accidental dark matter void and there's no uh, chance of us detecting something in our dark matter detector. Uh, this is not typically true for most microscopic models, but it's just something uh, to keep in mind. Okay, so yeah, if on small, so basically summary is on small scales of order, you know, the solar system, we don't know anything about the distribution of dark matter. We can reasonably extrapolate, and for specific models we can calculate, uh, but all of these quantities are kind of larger scale things. So any questions on that? <clears throat> okay, so switching gears uh, back to uh, axions. There's a ton of fun things I want to tell you about. Um, to summarize, um, we derived last time the low energy potential for a pion and an axion in the chiral effective, using the chiral effective Lagrangian, assuming an original term. Um, well, I guess what we derived was this theta term that came from Um, the CP, um, CP odd field strength term at high scales, we could rotate this theta term into the quark mass matrix. Uh, for simplicity, I assumed there was no existing phase in the quark mass matrix, which is not generically the case. So you can think of this theta as already being a sum of this gluon term and the quark mass term. And at uh, low energy, this gives us a potential for the pi on and this theta term. Which is minimized. Uh, this is some theta angle, which is a function of theta. Um, so this is minimized. for um, pi phi of theta times of pi and theta equals zero. Um, and we said that if we introduce the axion, which you should have in mind is some um, Goldstein boson of a broken global symmetry, um, uh, eight pi. so now we want to add this term. Uh, and I'll call it yeah, A over F, GG dual. Uh, so F is some high scale. Uh, here, in the effective theory, it's just a normalization for this extrascalar field operator. But if you, um, uh, if you UV complete this theory, this is usually associated to an order one factor times the symmetry breaking scale of the U1 symmetry, uh, which has an anomaly with, uh, with QCD and gives rise to this, uh, to this operator. Um, and this, we want this field to be dynamical, so we also have a kinetic term. Um, so here A is a pseudoscalar field with dimension one, um, and we also have um, potentially, let me write out all of the other terms. Um, well, yeah, okay, so, so these are the things that we're adding, and then this gives, um, this gives a new potential for the pion and the axion from uh, which we can derive uh, 
is the mass of the axion, which um, is of order m up, m down over m up plus m down squared, m pi, f pi over f a squared. Um, so yesterday I was um, rushing at the end and I skipped this term, which is actually important because you can see that in the limit of either of the two let quark masses going to zero, the axion mass goes to zero, and that's physical because uh, in that limit, the theta term actually has no effect. You can rotate it away with one of the chiral rotations we did uh, yesterday uh, to have uh, no physical effect. If the mass is zero, then the chiral rotation uh, can be done without introducing the phase back into the quark mass term. Um, and the other fun fact is that the pi on mass now also depends on, um, on the axion. You can just read it off, uh, or on the theta term, you can just read it off from there. So m pi is now a function of theta, which is m pi of theta equals zero times that, uh, sorry, I'm running out of space. Uh, okay, it's the same square root md over m up plus m down squared sine squared theta over two. So for example, if we were living in the theta equals pi vacuum, um, which would also have some interesting properties, the pi on mass would be different by a factor of square root of three. There would also be a bunch of other nuclear effects that are different. Um, so we're not living in the theta equals pi vacuum, um, which could still be um, CP preserving, and it's kind of interesting. Um, and so from this, you can also have, you can also derive other interesting constraints on um, either the CP violation in the strong sector or the presence of axions, which are kind of uh, background axions um, based on the fact that low energy nuclear theory properties are modified for large values of, uh, of theta. Okay, any questions on this? Everything is clear. You'll be able to explain to all your friends how the pi mass depends on the axion. Okay, good. Um, if you think of a question later, feel free to ask. Okay, so we have, uh, so to write down the full Lagrangian in this case, um, I've also redefined the axion around its new minimum, which is the initial theta term uh, that's multiplying GG dual. Um, which I can do with this um, axion shift symmetry. Okay, so if we perform the same calculations uh, as yesterday doing the chiral rotation, but now instead of uh, taking um, to the i, uh, gamma five uh, theta over two, um, the quarks, now we just do, there's also another matrix in here, e to the i, 5, q, uh, a over 2f. Um, we get a similar Lagrangian, except we have a few extra terms <clears throat> because the axion is now dynamical, and so its um, gradients and time dependence becomes important. So, of course, we have the kinetic term. We have this term, um, the original uh, strong force uh, CP term. We are now at the axion uh, relaxes to zero dynamically, so um, the expectation value of this is small. We have the quark uh, mass matrix. So the, this is now a 
high scales relative to um, nuclear physics, but still low energies. Um, you can also have this term, a F of dual, where F is now the photon field strength. Um, and I will define in a second what G a gamma gamma is. And this term is necessarily generated um, by these rotations that we've done. So axions automatically have a coupling to photons, although you can have accidental cancellations that make this term small. Uh, and then there's also a term which is d mu a over 2f times the um, some initial uh, quark current, which could have been there in the UV, times this um, CP violating term. So the axion can also couple to, say, electrons uh, in, this, in this form here. Um, and it can couple to quarks. Um, which gives you a, a derivative coupling to neutrons and protons at low energy. Um, again, this is model dependent, so this is some initial UV scale uh, term that depends on the theory that generates the axion, but there will be generically also some IR term that's generated um, for matching onto this uh, uh, QCD um, term. Okay, um, so that's, I already said the pion, Lagrangian, and the mass. Let me actually write out um, some of these parameters. So the mass, um, so you get a sense of the scales. The mass uh, is, has been calculated um, at next to leading order in Carl perturbation theory to be 5.70 times 10 to the minus 6 electron volts. Um, it's inversely proportional to Fa. So this is for if Fa is very large, 10 to the 12 GeV. So this is much larger than any scale we've accessed directly so far. And Ga gamma gamma, as I mentioned, uh, gets uh, two contributions. One is from the quark chiral, rota chiral rotation, um, which is minus um, the trace of the electromagnetic charges of the quarks, the up and down quark. Um, and comes out to be minus, uh, I'll just write down the number if you're interested in the formula, it's in my notes. And then there can be a UV contribution if there's other fields charged under both uh, E and M and the PQ symmetry that gives rise to the axion with an anomaly uh, E. So these are two integers, um, then you can have also a contribution to the, to the photon coupling. So things to note is that it's suppressed by the scale FA, which is this very large scale, and that there's two independent contributions. One is from uh, the fact that our quarks couple to ENM, and one is from potential UV contributions. Uh, and these two are integers, uh, whereas this one is some fraction of quark mass matrices. So or some, this is a function of quark mass matrices. Um, so generically, this thing is of order two, um, although it could be smaller. Um, good, from the same thing, you can also calculate uh, the neutron EDM, although that's doing it precisely is a bit difficult. Um, And I probably won't go into it. Um, but the a 
original um, observational evidence for theta being small is that um, we don't observe strong uh, sector CP violation, unlike other parts of the standard model, uh, like the electric sector. <clears throat> okay, so so that's um, it's a quick summary of the um, low energy manifestation of this axion. Um, originally, when it was proposed to solve the strong CP problem, to try to eliminate the theta parameter, um, people thought that the scale at which the symmetry is broken um, would be happening somewhere around the electric scale. There's also already a lot of symmetry breaking happening at that scale. So FA be around the weak scale, which is around 246 GV, question mark. Um, that was quickly excluded, um, even though the scale is very fairly high, especially at the time, which was the early 80s. Um, the axions can, through all of these types of couplings, contribute to rare decays of mesons. They can produce, be produced in stars um, and uh, in um, accelerator ex experiments. So this was um, quickly realized to not be the case. But uh, in retrospect, there is no particular reason to tie this X31 symmetry to the electric scale. In principle, FA can be any scale. Um, so the current parameter space looks like this. So log mass over EV, log GV over FA. Um, let me see if I can reproduce things uh, in a reasonable way uh, on the board. Okay, so we have the QCD line. So I'll draw two plots. One is for the fundamental coupling. Um, so this is the defining coupling of the QCD axion. Uh, and unless we can detect this interaction, we won't know for sure if a particle we've detected is really the QCD axion or some other particle with similar properties. Unfortunately, as you all know, strongly coupled theories are very complicated. And uh, in particular, QCD at low, low energy is very complicated. And so figuring out how to tease out small signals in things like nuclei, um, quark and gluon interactions is um, quite challenging. So if this is the QCD axion line, we have a bit of information uh, for this coupling. Um, we have an upper bound going to fairly high masses from supernova 1987A. So this is a supernova that went off in 1987. Um, and we saw a neutrino burst from the supernova uh, telling us how quickly the energy was being released. If you compare uh, that energy to the energy released in axions with this coupling, which is of order 10 to the minus 8. Um, I'll have to qualify that in a second. Then the energy released in axions will be comparable to the energy released in neutrinos, which is experimentally excluded. Um, there's also a constraint from different astrophysics properties, which are BBN, and neutron stars, which have to do with the properties I alluded to earlier, that if the um, axion is there in the early universe or is somehow generated inside of a neutron star, um, it would completely change nuclear physics properties, and we know them well enough those times uh, and in those places to, to set constraints. 
Um, you might be asking a question of what does this parameter space even mean, which is a good question, because the QCD axion for this part, for the fundamental coupling is really just a line. Um, there's no, the, the mass is uniquely predicted as a function of this coupling, right? So um, this parameter space is just kind of broadening the line to allow us to plot these constraints in a meaningful way. Um, but, and you can build models where the axion is, for example, a bit lighter than the QCE line because there's an extra UV contribution to its mass. Uh, and then you can ask these questions. Um, and there's experiments, laboratory experiments that are proposed that are trying to look for, um, for this coupling. And, you know, right now there's some more up here, but hopefully with um, development, um, they will be able to reach further uh, and actually probe the QCD axion line. There's another interesting constraint on here, which I'm, I should put some, sorry, I should put some more parameters on here. So let's say this is 10 to the uh, minus 19, which is the Planck scale, and this intersects at about 6, uh, times 10 to the minus 2 EV. So this tells us that the QCD axion above about 6 times 10 to minus 2 is excluded. Um, this bound, the way I've drawn it here, actually assumes this coupling here took neutrons and protons from the supernova. If you literally just assume the fundamental coupling and that there's a cancel, accidental cancellation, um, then it weakens by uh, couple orders of magnitude. Uh, there's also a constraint here, which is independent of um, the QCD coupling, but just depends on uh, the axion potential and its mass. So this is from 10 to the minus 13 EV to about 10 to the minus 11 EV. And this constraint is due to black hole super radiance. Um, which is something I've spent time working on. Um, so if you want to ask me uh, questions after about, um, about it in more detail, I'm happy to discuss. So the idea is that black holes, astrophysical black holes out there in our universe, um, or generically curved black holes, are unstable uh, to, um, are unstable in the presence of massive bosonic fields. Uh, if you have a field, a scalar field, a vector field, whose mass is of, whose Compton wavelength is of order of the size of the black hole, um, the Kerr metric is classically unstable to the production of these, uh, of these particles. These particles are produced in bound states around the black hole. Um, there's a black hole, and you produce some classical cloud of axions, which extracts the spin of the black hole. Um, in principle, this process continues until the black hole spins down completely. Uh, but on for real astrophysical black holes with real ages that are finite, um, they'll typically spin down to some value. Um, however, we do observe rapidly spinning black holes, both in astrophysical observations and now with LIGO observations. So given the fact that we see highly spinning black holes, we can exclude parameter space uh, for any uh, light boson in a mass range that, so just to give you a sense, this is about an inverse 100 kilometers, which is the size of the black holes that we see in LIGO mergers. Um, to put this on the QCD axion plane, you have to ask what happens if the particles have a non-trivial potential, not just a mass. And what happens is that black holes spin down less efficiently, uh, which is why this bound stops at some point. So that's all we really know about the fundamental coupling. It's much easier to work with the photon coupling because 
as humans, we're really good at manipulating photons. That's what we can see. That's what a lot of our detectors are tailored for. Um, so it's still very difficult because these scales are much higher than anything, um, than energy scales in the lab. So all of our experiments will be suppressed by a big ratio of scales. But still, uh, we can do something. So there's the same QCD axion line. Now, usually, when you see plots of this, you'll see two lines, which are labeled by acronyms that are the last names of the authors of these original models, EFSZ. So these two lines are basically, uh, if you take this GA gamma gamma uh, to be minus 1.29, or minus 1.29 plus SU5 multiplets, which is, gives you a factor of 8 thirds here. Um, so this is GA gamma gamma now as a function of mass. Again, in EV, and the GA gamma gamma is in inverse GEV. You have similar uh, processes um, or similar kinds of constraints on here. So there's also. The superradiance constraint, now it's suppressed. Now it's, you can translate it assuming a standard conversion between photon and uh, underlying coupling. So this is excluded. Um, you also have experiment called CAST which is a telescope with a lid on that stares at the sun uh, with a background magnetic field and looks for axions that are produced in the sun and uh, convert in the background magnetic field to photons, which I'll discuss a bit more, I guess, uh, in a second. Um, and then there's laboratory. Uh, then there's other astrophysical constraints. Uh, this is around an EV. And then there's laboratory uh, experiments, namely ADMX, which is um, the most successful so far in reaching QCD axion parameter space and space at the University of Washington. And there's some other experiments here that basically rely on the fact um, that in the background of a magnetic field, axions will convert to photons. And then you have to be clever about how you construct your background and how you detect the photons. And that covers a lot of these different approaches, including these astrophysics bounds where, for example, you have magnetic fields out there in the galaxy or around compact objects that allow axions to convert to photons. At high masses, uh, you also have stellar cooling bounds. Which, go, which are kind of independent of the mass as long as the temperature of your object is larger than the mass of the particle. And then at higher masses, you have decays. So if the axion uh, is around as dark matter, here the, the coupling to two photons is big enough that the decay of the axion to two photons um, starts to be comparable to, enough to the age of the universe to place a constraint. Uh, and I should also put some scales here. So this is, this is uh, 10 to the minus 10. This is about, sorry, this is not at all to scale. This is 10 to the minus 12 around here. Um, so some of these constraints assume that the axion is the dark matter. For example, this, these laboratory experiments assume that energy density on the left-hand board over there, uh, to draw these constraints, they would scale up and down if the local dark matter density was different. Uh, same with some of these decays. Um, but experiments like CAST and some of these astro constraints just assume that the particle exists in the Lagrangian and is produced in, through this interaction in um, stellar objects or in hot um, in stars and um, supernova and white dwarves, uh, just through that interaction without assuming any relic density. Um, 
if you want to look up uh, more on these, there's a, if you can look up the PDG Axion review. And there's also uh, someone named uh, Kieran O'Hare. I think he's a postdoc, not 100% sure. In, um, and he, kept, he keeps a GitHub of, Axi if you Google his name and GitHub Axions, he keeps like a really extensive record of all of the searches for Axions as well as the proposed searches um, for different sets of couplings. And you can see these plots and colors and without my terrible line drawing skills. Uh, any questions? on how, how we look for, for these particles or what, uh, what some of these processes are? Yes? So I thought there, I thought there were constraints on how light dark matter could be from the idea that it has to be cold to the minus of the Earth. Because it's not going to properly. Yes. How does the axion avoid taking That's a great question. And I'm sorry, I've been terrible about repeating questions. Um, so. Apologies to the recording. Um, the question was, uh, how does the axion avoid the constraints of being a cold dark matter candidate? Um, because it's very light, and typically uh, you hear these constraints of um, dark matter has to be heavier than something in order to be um, non-relativistic during a long time in the universe. Um, the answer, uh, which brings me to my next um, section, um, and if I have time at the end, I'll tell you a little bit more about the detection possibilities, but I want to get to the dark matter part, because these are dark matter lectures, um, is that the axion is never in thermal equilibrium in the standard, with the standard model. So the production mechanism for the axion is what's called non-thermal non production. Um, so currently, Very broadly, for production of dark matter, and this is a bit of a tautology, but it can be either thermal or non thermal. This is a theorem. Um, so, thermal means that it was at some point in. Uh, thermal equilibrium with the standard model and its temperature tracks that of the standard model. We know that um, this is important that since BBN, the expansion rate uh, of the universe um, is well described by being uh, dominated by a standard model degrees of freedom. So you sh shouldn't have some other dark matter sector with a temperature far above the standard model sector that's decoupled from it because then it would dominate uh, the evolution of our universe, and that's excluded. So either the dark matter has to have been in thermal contact, or it has to be cold. Um, and also, it should be cold uh, to um, satisfy other observational constraints. Um, so examples of thermal dark matter are WIMPs uh, or other um, similar particles, let's call them, that have large enough interactions with a standard model to keep to to keep them in a in thermal equilibrium at some point in our universe. Non-thermal axions. You can also have other production, other types of particles like um, vectors or fermions, sometimes known as wimpzillas, which are produced in the early universe uh, without any contact with the standard model. Of course, this assumes that this means that there's a constraint on the couplings of the axion. So for example, if Fa was um, low enough, so that the interactions between the axion and the standard model were strong enough, um, the axions would be produced. Um, 
those are all higher dimension operators, um, the axion couples in the form of a um, standard model. So um, these interactions become more important earlier in the universe when the temperature is large. So typically, axion standard model interactions are more efficient at, at higher temperature. Um, so any kind of production of thermal production of axions can happen in the early universe if the temperature of the universe was high enough at some point. So for example, if inflation ended and we reheated to 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 GeV, um, we will soon be able to see, well, maybe I'm being optimistic, but we will potentially be able to see evidence of some population of thermal axions um, in cosmological observations because they were produced. But they're not produced in large enough abundance to be dark matter, and in any case, it would not be, it would not be good dark matter if they were produced thermally. Um, any questions so far? I went a bit off script, so I'm not sure if that made complete sense. So let me know if, if, if you have questions. So, so how is how are axions? How do axions behave like dark matter in the first place? Um, they're a bit, they're quite different from how we think about standard model particles, which are rattling around at some temperature, uh, scattering off one another. Axions are better thought of as. Um, background classical field, which doesn't have, <clears throat> which is, which is never, uh, has a, th which never has a thermal distribution, uh, but, and whose mass is very small, yet you can see that it still behaves as called dark matter by looking at how it evolves in an expanding universe. So, how am I doing on time? Okay, so axions um, as dark matter first we can do a rough uh, estimate if uh, the local energy of dark matter is about 0.4 GV per centimeter cubed, then the number density of axions is about uh, 10 to the 27 for a mass of 10 to the minus 6 EV. So this is a very large occupation number. Um, and we can basically treat, and this is today, and of course the energy density is larger in the early universe, so it's even higher at some point. Um, and we can treat it as a classical field, classical coherent field, um, which is nice and simplifies our life quite a bit. Um, And initially, um, as I said, uh, let's see how the axion actually behaves as dark matter. So we can look at in the early universe of the equation of motion in FRW metric with <clears throat> scale factor A of t and Hubble rate H. <clears throat> so a uh, regular um, scalar field has an equation of motion, phi double dot. So I'm switching from A to phi to not get confused with the scale factor. So phi is now our axion. Uh, phi double dot equals minus 
v prime of phi, where this is a derivative, the prime is a derivative with respect to the field. Um, so this is flat space. If you have um, an expanding universe, there's extra terms which manifest as Hubble friction. So there's a term proportional to phi dot. Um, there's still the derivative of the scalar field, of the potential of the scalar field. And there's also gradient terms. Um, which I guess should also be there, but anyway, as zero. So you can see the gradient terms redshift away very quickly. Um, so even if the axion started its life as um, some distribution of uh, momenta, uh, this term dilutes away as the scale factor increases. Um, so now we'll ignore it. Uh, and we can study this equation in two limits. One, when um, the Hubble scale is large compared to the scales in the potential, and one when it's small. We have the axiom potential over there. Um, so expanding around the minimum, this is just the mass squared. So I'll do that, but we'll have to come back. Um, we'll have to come back uh, to a more complete potential, uh, or at least I want to comment on it. So for in the case where, um, so this is a simple mechanics problem uh, of a damped harmonic oscillator. If Hubble is large compared to the mass, um, then this um, oscillator is overdamped. If it's small, then it's underdamped. So for H large compared to the mass, the solutions is phi equals constant. Um, also assuming that the time derivative of phi is uh, negligible. Um, so the picture you should have in mind is that this is a scalar field um, that, well, there's a couple of different pictures, but the picture I'll be focusing on today is this is a scalar field that's around during the time of inflation. Uh, will, which will have diluted uh, any velocity dependence of the field and just kept an overall uh, overall value for this for the field for h uh, much less than m um, you can solve this uh, equation using h one over two t as we derived on Monday uh, during radiation domination, which is which the axiom better start acting like matter during radiation domination because by the time it's matter domination, it should be the matter. Um, and then the solution is phi of t. Um, if we also, yeah, uh, phi of t is phi, um, let me call this phi naught. It's a matching coefficient, which is order one times phi naught, uh, which takes us between these two solutions. And you can actually solve this equation fully. It gives you some Bessel function. But uh, just for simplicity, uh, this is phi naught over A of t to the 3 halves sine m phi of t. So the time evolution of this field during uh, radiation domination uh, looks something like this. 
to 5t, starts at some initial value, it's frozen at early times, and then around um, when Hubble, 3 times Hubble is of order of the mass of the field, it starts to shift and oscillate, oscillate with smaller and smaller oscillations. And the overall scaling um, is 1 over a of t to the 3 halves, which if you calculate the stress energy tensor of a scalar field and look at the energy component, uh, this is given by 1 half m squared squared plus 1 half um, phi dot squared uh, up to uh, velocity correction, but here we're still assuming that they've redshifted away, uh, which is plugging in the solution is 1 half m squared phi naught squared over a cubed times sine squared plus cosine squared, uh, which is 1. So the sine squared comes from the mass term, and the cosine squared comes from the uh, kinetic term. So they, at uh, neglecting uh, spatial gradients, the energy density of the field uh, is constant in space and right shifts as 1 over a cubed, which is exactly what we want for matter. So. This is telling us that light scalar fields, um, without ever being in thermal contact uh, with the standard model and for arbitrary mass, can have um, uh, the, the correct behavior uh, to act as cold dark matter today. Um, any questions on that? Ah, uh, good. So, so, so far, um, so here I just assume, I just expanded the potential around the minimum and said it was a quadratic potential with the mass m. Um, more generally, the potential for the QCD axion is given uh, by that mess up there, um, which is approximately, uh, let me draw it, which is... You can also, yeah, um, so let me rewrite this. So the potential, let me just reuse this equation, the potential for the axion is um, overall scale. Let's say we've set this. Uh, the pi on expectation value, uh, and this is now sine squared of A over 2F, or phi as I'm calling it now. Uh, so this is the potential, which uh, has a minimum of phi equals 0, and is periodic. It's uh, well approximated by... Um, well, actually, it's not particularly, but often, often people take it to be a cosine because that's what you get from um, uh, instanton effects as a function of the of phi. This is what I get for changing notation. Okay, phi is our axion. Um, the height is uh, m by squared f by squared times function of the quark masses. And around the minimum, it's given by just the mass, uh, which I had written somewhere, um, which is a function of FA. Uh, and you can also calculate the quartic term, um, which is of order m, a, m squared 
over f squared uh, with an extra factor of three, I think, uh, or something like that. I don't remember exactly. So the core, basically, the deviation, and remember, the mass is very small. The, the, the scale f is very large. So the quartic is really tiny. Uh, it's not going to be very important unless the field is close to the maximum here, which it could be, um, and that could give you some interesting effects, and that would deviate from the story. The other way in which you would deviate from, uh, you deviate from the story for some time until the field relaxes close to the minimum, which it will always do. So that is always a good approximation at late times. The question is what happens uh, at early times, which can change a bit. Uh, the other important thing, which I didn't emphasize, is that this is a potential at zero temperature. Uh, when QCD confines and you have um, a chiral condensate in our vacuum, uh, that's how we got here. We talked about pions as goldstones of, uh, of that symmetry breaking uh, at high temperatures, um, there is no chiral condensate, and this potential is zero. So V of T much larger than lambda QCD, where QCD confines, is zero. Um, so that means that for the QCD axion at early times, um, so this for the QCD axion, this transition is actually a bit subtle uh, because it doesn't just depend on the universe expanding and the Hubble scale dropping past the mass, but the mass is actually turning on as a function of time because this potential is growing as uh, you go through the QCD phase transition. There, I think there was another question. No? Okay. So, oh, I have 15 minutes to tell you everything else you need to know about dark matter. Okay, uh, well, let's finish the, the axions and then I'll just make a couple comments. So we have, so we have this um, energy density, which is scaling like matter, and we can calculate, um, so that's good. We want dark matter to act as matter. Um, it's cold because um, both of initial conditions but also um, gradients, which are analogous to the temperature uh, or velocity distributions, uh, not temperature, strictly speaking, uh, but velocity distributions also get redshifted away during, for example, a period of inflation. Uh, so that's good. Uh, but then the question is, is it the right amount of dark matter? Because in addition to dark matter being um, cold and dark and matter, and these are also pretty dark. As you see, we, we really have a lot of parameter space where we can't see them even though we try very hard. Um, we also know the abundance of dark matter quite accurately. Um, so we want to see if the axions predict the right amount of dark matter. And this was actually quite exciting. Uh, when it was realized that axions can be a good dark matter candidate because originally people were a bit bummed that it wasn't a good, um, the FA around the electric weak scale was not, was not um, allowed observationally. Although in retrospect, as I said, it doesn't necessarily have to be around the electric weak scale. And in fact, uh, these days we know that axions um, are also often show up in um, UV theories like string theory. Uh, these are particles that can come out not even of a field, not, which don't necessarily need a field theory for the like U1 Pitchuquin symmetry breaking to be the QCD axion. You could have some uh, higher dimensional form fields that live in extra dimensions and then they get compactified and then the axion sticks around in 4D. There's a nice, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of literature on this. Uh, so, so and if you have string axions, then of course the typical F scale would be closer to the string scale, which we think is fairly high, uh, or at least definitely not at the electric weak scale. Um, so that's motivation for 
high F A axions, or F could be at the gut scale, where a lot of other symmetries are broken, which is around 10 to the 16 GeV, um, or some intermediate scale. Um, if you're, there's, a, there's a lot of papers on string axions, uh, but there's a nice review by Ben Safdie uh, from last year's Tazi lectures. He has a small section on it with references that you can look up. Um, I think I wrote down the archive number. Hold on. Oh, yeah. Okay. 2303. So he has, um, yeah, he also has a big discussion of axions, including a section on string axions. Ben was a grad student uh, in formal theory. He thought about like RG flows and string theory and stuff. And then he decided to switch to particle physics and now is a very successful particle physicist. So you too can do that if you're interested. Uh, he's faculty at uh, Berkeley now. Um, so uh, good, okay. And then he's an undergraduate at the University of Colorado. Uh, that's true, yes. Um, good. Uh, so uh, what was I saying? Axion abundance calculations. Excellent. Okay. Um, so we can also compute um, the axion abundance uh, today. So the let's say that at the time that the axion starts oscillating, so let's call this time t os, which is basically equivalent to the initial condition of the scalar field. It has an amplitude that's given by phi initial squared m squared, which we can rewrite as theta initial squared m squared f squared. Um, just redefining the amplitude of the scalar field in units of this theta angle, uh, which by definition goes between pi and minus pi um, for, this, for this compact field. Uh, so this tells us roughly that there's an upper bound in the energy density, which is bounded of order uh, mass squared times F squared. Which is why I was saying it was, it's kind of good that the uh, low F axions got excluded because you can see if F is too small, this energy density is never going to be big enough for a certain um, range of masses. Actually, I'm not sure if you can see that yet because I haven't told you the rest of the story. Uh, so then we can just redshift using that scaling relation uh, to the energy density uh, at, for example, matter radiation equality when we know how much dark matter there is, is given by the energy density earlier at oscillation time times the ratio of temperatures at um, sorry, ratio of temperatures. Uh, temperature now is lower, so this should be smaller. And also the ratio of um, the number of degrees of freedom, if you're doing this carefully, which I'm not. But um, so if, if there's a change in the number of degrees of freedom between these two times, then there's extra entropy that's uh, injected into uh, the standard model bath. And you have to keep track of that. Um, so this, if you do it out, is going to give you, if you assume, so there are two cases, two cases um, that are of interest. One is m of t equals m naught. So this is not the QCD axion, but just some other field um, um, that doesn't care about QCD instantons or chiral symmetry breaking, 
um, and just has a mass. Or you could have m of t is mqcd as written there, which transitions smoothly between zero at high temperatures and um, the potential given by the potential at low temperatures um, in a way that's actually quite complicated to compute precisely, but is being done uh, in lattice calculations. Uh, so there's two cases here, which then give you different scalings. One is that the uh, abundance of dark matter today is um, roughly around the right value. Theta initial squared um, scales as the square root of the mass. Um, let's say 10 to the uh, minus 6 EV uh, and FA and linearly, uh, no, quadratically with FA. Uh, 10 to the uh, 12. There might be order one factors here. <clears throat> or in this case, the scaling is different. So it's still proportional to the initial energy density. But the redshifting um, is more complicated because of the time dependence of the mass. And this is, and also there's a relationship between the mass and FA. So this is FA over 3 times 10 to the 11 GV uh, to about the 1.1 uh, 1 .1 power, where this comes from the way that a potential turns on uh, during the KCD phase transition. Um, sorry, this is very fast. But basically, the intuition here is this is just the initial density. This is the initial amplitude. And then if the mass is always on, then if the mass is smaller, um, then you start oscillating uh, later. Uh, so you don't dilute the energy density as much, but also the initial energy density is smaller. So overall, you get the square root factor. Uh, if you put, put in the overall scaling and relationship with F for the QCD axion, then you get uh, this relation. So this is QCD. Uh, and so you can see. Uh, that this points to the scales of F of about 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12 GeV, which is currently being probed by experiment, um, but is quite open parameter space. And also, if your initial angle is smaller, then you can have uh, larger FAs and you can have axions as light as um, you want, basically, up to the fuzzy dark matter bound, which we discussed yesterday. So um, that's the story about axion dark matter uh, in a nutshell. Of course, axions are not the only dark matter candidates. Um, there are many kinds of um, other particles which can also be produced in this um, non-thermal manner. Um, you can have other scalar fields which have a different set of couplings. So axions have uh, couplings of the type A over FA, uh, some CP odd uh, operator of the standard model. You can have a scalar, because they're pseudoscalars, you can have a scalar field, which is suppressed by some other high scale with different standard model operators, which are uh, CP even, for example, F squared rather than FF dual, or any other, like the mass of the electron something else. Um, you can have vectors, although they can have interesting dynamics early on. Uh, and that's just for non-thermal candidates. Of course, if you are in contact with the standard model at early times, then you can also produce uh, dark matter through scattering with the standard model. And there's a concrete prediction of what its abundance is as a function of its couplings to itself and to standard model particles. So if you have uh, other than particular motivation for the dark matter model, if you have a specific theory 
but you want to be dark matter, you should always ask the question of how is it produced? Is it cold? What is its, what is its abundance? Is it consistent with what we currently know about our cosmology? Uh, that narrows down the possibilities more than you would think. Um, there are some great uh, examples which are motivated and are currently being explored with experiments. Uh, there might be there might be others, uh, or it might dark matter might be something we haven't thought of yet, and we'll hopefully think of soon or see uh, as a surprise in our observations. So um, thanks for your attention, and uh, uh, I'll take any questions. Ready for coffee? Yeah. All right, well, this is Masha's last lecture, so let's give her one more round of applause for a very nice set of lectures. <laughs>